Just a quick announcement. Uh, it's noon. Uh, we're going to wait a couple of seconds. Uh, according to the open meeting law, you can uh, start a meeting late, but you can't start it early. Um, and so um, we'll wait a couple more seconds to see if we can. Uh, ah, all right. I'd like to call to order the City of Las Vegas Historic Preservation Commission for March the 22nd, 2023. Uh, please uh, call the roll. Chair Stodal. Present. Vice Chair Laramie. Absent with excuse. Commissioner Levine. Here. Commissioner Beck. Commissioner Hotchkiss. Commissioner Serfas. Commissioner Cosgrove. Commissioner Palacios? Here. Commissioner Moody? Here by phone. Commissioner Perdue? Here. Commissioner Roberts? Here. Commissioner Seabrant? Here. Commissioner Gillespie? Here. Thank you. We do have a quorum. We have a voting majority or quorum. Yes, we do. Thank you. Item number two, announcement regarding the compliance with the open meeting law. Are we, in fact, in compliance with the state's open meeting law? Yes, we are. Thank you. Item three, public comment. Comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward and give your name for the record, the amount of discussion, as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Would anybody like to speak at this point? Hearing none, uh, we will move on to the, uh, the next item. Uh, please reflect the uh, our, our newest member has just joined us commissioner surface yes thank you uh item four chair announcements the chair does not have any announcements at this point item five for possible action the final minutes by reference of the regular meeting of february 22nd 2023 um an action item. I hope you've all had a chance to review the uh, the minutes. Uh, good discussion at the last meeting on several key topics. Look for a motion. I so move. Identify for the record, please. Commissioner Purdue. We have a motion. Um, any opposed? Or let's just go this way. Uh, uh, general public. Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? And I heard a new voice online. Excuse me, I have Commissioner Moody and who else online? Uh, Don Hotchkiss. Thank you. Do you uh, is your vote yes on approval of the minutes? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number six, 22-0688-HPC1. This is an abeyance item. Possible discussion for action regarding an application to designate the Mission Linning Building located at 1001 South 1st Street uh, on the City of Las Vegas listing of the uh, historic register of historic sites within the City of Las Vegas. Dr. Seabrand. Thank you, Seabrand, for the record. Uh, the applicant has asked for this item to be obeyed to the May 22nd HPC meeting. Uh, the applicant has hired a historic preservation specialist that is going to be providing an additional report to the uh, original application. So we can keep this as an abeyance. We won't need to withdraw this because we will be able to add the new report to this item for the May meeting. All right, so the question, though, that came up during the last meeting, the applicant requested that two things. One, that this building be put on the register of historic places within the city, and also that the HPC approve the building design. So, so he, this, is, this item is only to place the, that property, the Mission Linden Building, on the Las Vegas Historic Property Register. Okay, so, so if, if the applicant is, is, as they did according to the minutes, wants to put this uh, for the HPC to approve the building, that's not before us. 
the only item before this, the committee, when this item comes back on May, is if it's being placed on the historic register. <coughs> so we, we, do we need another a, a, a vote to obey, to obey it again? Look for a, a motion to obey this item to the meeting of April the... No, May 22nd, please. To May 22nd. Yeah, so our next meeting is April 12th because Chambers is not available, so it's an incredibly short turnaround. So we, we've we already missed the cutoff date for submission of reports to, to our department, so it has to be the May 22nd meeting. Excuse me, that would be May 24th. Oh. S sorry, May 22nd is centennial. May 24th meeting. <laughs> All right, so we look for a, a motion to obey this item until the May 24th meeting. Commissioner Surface, I'll make a motion to obey this item to the May 24th Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Further discussion? General public? Hearing on all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Oh, aye. On the phone. Sorry. On the phone? Hotchkiss votes aye on the phone. Thank you. Moody votes aye. Item number 723-0124-HPC1, discussion for possible action regarding approval of funding the amount of $18,500 for consultation services by New Art LLC for a land acknowledgement ceremony for the centennial celebration of the historic West Side School located at 330 West Washington Avenue. Dr. Seabrent. Thank you. So, Seabrent for the record. So, just as background on this item, the West Side School turns 100 years old this year, and we wanted to mark that occasion with a celebration, which will take place on September 30th. So, the city formed a, a large working group, and that includes representatives from several different city departments, including, of course, ours, as well as representatives from the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe, the West Side School Alumni Association, the Clark County School District, and the Department of Public Safety. So requests have come from this working group include uh, holding a parade to kick off the celebration, as well as an opening ceremony that will include a land acknowledgement. So our Parks and Recreation Department, the, they will be working with representatives from the school alumni on the parade portion of the event, but we will be working with representatives from the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe on the opening ceremony portion of this event. So we're still working on the overall final details of the entire celebration because it's supposed to be an entire day celebration. But we do know that the parade will end at the West Side School. And <coughs> once it's ended, then we will have an opening ceremony that will include singers and dancers from several of the local indigenous tribes. So this item is to prove a contract with uh, Fawn Douglas as our cultural consultant for the ceremony and everything leading up to that ceremony. So I would now like to um, invite Ms. Douglas to the podium to give us a presentation on what that celebration will entail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. And thank you so much for letting me speak today in front of the Historic Preservation Commission. It's nice to be here and meet all of you. Um, so a little bit about myself, and I'll you know kind of get into what we'll be talking about. But um, yeah, Hagarawayak, Nini Nian Fawn, Fawn Douglas, Nick Namuvi. I just introduced myself in my language. Uh, of course, just like yourselves, we're into our you know historic preservation as well, and teaching our youth and our people, our language and our histories and our cultural ways. And this is an extension of that: is to have this education at this. Uh, amazing event, this centennial event. I'm a member of the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. Uh, in fact, my tribe is one of the smallest tribes in North America. We are currently 50 tribal members over the age of 21, but the city of Las Vegas is home to over 50,000 natives or people who self-identify as Native American that come from many tribes all across the United States. Um, I also serve as a city of Las Vegas arts commissioner for Ward 3. I am the co-owner of the Nuwu Art and Activism Studios located on Maryland Parkway. My partner and myself, we've uh, transformed what used to be the Sharia Tefila Synagogue uh, Temple and its adjoining buildings into a thriving arts community. But we could talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I'm the cultural engagement specialist for Meow Wolf, and I'm the co-founder for the Weaving Our Cultures Arts Festival, which used to be uh, our Women of Color Arts Festival. 
Um, I'm on the board of directors for Indigenous AF INC, and that is the nonprofit arm to Nubu Art. Uh, I'm the curator of community, and I do cultural consultation, and that's what I've been doing these past few years. And a little bit about my history, too. I'm, uh, I just earned my MFA from UNLV in 2022. And before that, I taught as an instructor in the Interdisciplinary Gender and Ethnic Studies Department for two years. Uh, I taught for the American Indian Indigenous Studies course, which is basically the introduction to, uh, well, Native Studies. Um, I am also involved with the American Indian Alliance at UNLV, which are faculty members, community members. Uh, and also, I was the former president and still involved with the Native American Alumni Club for UNLV. I'm also the former, former councilwoman for the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe. I served three terms uh, several years ago. Um, very much enjoyed that. And I was also on the education committee for my tribe as well. And currently, I'm a tribal appointed um, advisory committee member for Tule Springs, the Tusk Advisory Committee. And so I just wanted to talk about a few of those hats. I wear a lot of hats here, but they all connect uh, completely when it comes to arts, activism, and cultural continuity. Okay, sorry, I'm getting used to your tech. Um, but yeah, the, everything I just said is right there. <coughs> And for this presentation today, I'm gonna to try to stay on point. I could speak a lot longer, but I know that we have a lot of things on the agenda. Uh, for this presentation, I'm gonna focus on my tribe, artistry and community, the historic West Side School Centennial, the opening ceremony, what to expect, the budget, and time for open discussion. Okay, so my tribe, like I mentioned, is the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. We're one of the Southern Paiute nations in Southern Nevada, uh, but our Southern Paiutes are not limited just to Southern Nevada. We also are in Utah, Arizona, and Southern California. And this is a map that kind of shows that span of our Salt Song Trail, where we gather, where we you know, talk about our songs, our histories, and our cultural landscape. Uh, my artistry is connected to my people and these lands. Uh, this is something that I had done in watercolor, you know, where the, where the creator goes to dream on the Desert National Wildlife Refuge, uh, which is located just north of here. And with my art, my art is very important to my storytelling. I have storytelling ingrained in each art, art piece that I, com that I complete. And with that history, I also talk about, you know, my other tribes. So I'm also of mixed heritage. I'm, uh, you know, from the Pawnee, Southern Cheyenne, and Muscogee nations, as well as Scottish, too. And I'm very proud of these different lineages that I share. And within this, I've been a former, oh, went down. Oh, there we go. Uh, well, not former, because I'm going to get back in the powwow circle. But I've been very involved in Native American dance and even bridging that community contact with other Native Americans outside of our tribe to learn about their cultural heritages uh, through powwow dance, like fancy shawl, jingle, traditional styles. And we could talk a little bit about that, too. My people are known for our weaving, our basket weaving. In fact, the Helen J. Stewart collection is the largest collection of Southern Paiute baskets in the world. And this is a basket that I was holding. This is at the Lost City Museum. This is my great grandmother, Topsy Swain's basket. Um, and she was very proud of this. And I was very, I am very proud of this, like knowing that this person is in my, my family and she's just so inspiring. And I continue these practices with my own weaving techniques but modernizing it, uh, but still keep it on with tradition by foraging these materials within our Southern Paiute lands, which we're in. I found these wires, I found this, uh, this conduit. And so that is, you know, myself foraging and keeping with tradition of foraging in the land to create these new materials. And working with our community, here's some of our community members getting ready for a performance. So my artistry is multidisciplinary. I'm not only a painter, a storyteller, but I'm also a performing artist as well. And these are some of the, the youth, well, from our, from our community, from the Las Vegas Paiute tribe, making some regalia items for a performance piece that we did right in front of the Nuwu Arts uh, Community Center. And so this is here on Maryland Parkway. 
And I was uh, joined with Rose B. Simpson in this photo, and this is where we performed a performance that was in, uh, entailed with land back. Uh, land back is for us to claim, reclaim the areas that we're in, rematriate these areas, and to be able to educate about you know, the communities that are still here. And within my roles, like I said earlier, I'm a cultural engagement specialist for Meow Wolf. I've created land acknowledgments. My job with Meow Wolf doesn't only exist here in Las Vegas, Nevada at Omega Mart, but it also exists at the Denver Convergence Station, the Santa Fe House of Eternal Return, and currently in Grapevine, Texas, where we're gonna be opening later on in the summer. And part of my job is I build these community connections. I build connections to the indigenous groups that are in the areas of whatever city that we'll be in because land acknowledgements are so important. It's so important to recognize and understand and learn about the communities uh, wherever we may be. And those are some of our dancers, Sol Martinez and Gina Yazi. And here's just a picture. So if you're not familiar with the Niwu Art and Activism Studios and the Gallery and Community Center, you might be familiar with these buildings that were there on Maryland Parkway between uh, Franklin and Oki. It used to be the Sharia Tefila um, Congregation Temple, and the rabbi lived in the house to the right there, and there was the mikvah in the back. But we have transformed these buildings into what you see today, and we're a growing, thriving community where we uh, work to decolonize through the arts and education. And here's just a photo of one of our uh, zine-making work, uh, workshops that we have with the kids and youth of all ages. We're not just limited to you know uh, serving children, but the community. So that was a little bit about me, but I want to talk more about the historic West Side School Centennial and plans for the opening ceremony. So people are asking, well, what to expect? What can we expect from this indigenous portion of the opening ceremony for this school? Well, when I was reading and what I've learned about the historic West Side School is that it was originally built um, and had many Paiute children there. So the local Paiutes were the original students of this school. And then as it's grown, you know, it's changed and expanded. Uh, but we want to be able to be a part of that and to talk about that history because history is so important. And it's so important to understanding that past so we can walk forward in this path together. Uh, so with the land acknowledgement, you know, basically it's a way of recognizing the history, whose land we're on a respect to the community's past, present, and emerging, and for relationship building. Um, I don't know how many people here are connected with the local you know, Southern Paiutes, but we should be, especially being a part of the historic commission. I think these are paths we should be walking with together. Uh, for the opening ceremony, this land acknowledgement, I will be talking about the history of the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. You know, our start here. Uh, well, we've been here since time immemorial. Um, but, you know, what our journey has been with the growth of Las Vegas. Uh, during the opening ceremony, I'll also talk about the education, about the dances and the groups, because there's three groups that I want to work with uh, during the opening ceremony, and they're very key and important uh, to this event. But also being able to introduce key leaders. So, Nuwu Wanumiga. Uh, Wanumiga means dancing, Nuwu means Paiute, so basically translated Paiute's dancing. Uh, this, these are some of the members of the dance group. In fact, this photo was taken recently at uh, an event I created over at the Red Rock uh, Conservation Area, and we do this event. We uh, talk about our dances, we talk about the importance, because these are different powwow dance styles. And so left to right, I mean, you have a fancy shawl dancer, and with these shawls, these girls are dancing the dance of emergence. It's also known as the butterfly dance. And it's super aerobic and very beautiful to see. And you see the dancers that have the cones on their dresses, they're jingle dancers. Uh, that's not a traditional Paiute dance, but it's a gift from the Ojibwe or the Chippewa. And many people across the nation from different tribes uh, celebrate this dance. And it's a healing dance. And then we have the grass dancer in the center. And uh, originally, like for uh, dancers to clear out the areas where, where there was like really long dra grasses in the plains, these dancers would go out and stomp them down so there would be a dance area for powwow dances. 
And powwows, for those of you that aren't aware, are social dances, social gatherings. And we have all these different dance styles and more that are at powwows. In fact, the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe, we just celebrated our 30th annual Snow Mountain, <coughs> Snow Mountain Powwow that's located just north of Las Vegas, kind of going towards the Mount Charleston or Nubakai area. And uh, with this celebration, it's rekindling friendships, it's healing, it's ceremony, but it's not limited to our people or to other intertribal groups. It's also for everyone. People from all ages, all walks of life join in this celebration. Uh, they get to shop, enjoy really good food, and, and it's a lot of fun. In fact, here's one of our dancers, uh, Raina Salazar. She was performing at the hospitality school at UNLV last year uh, with the rest of our group. But besides our powwow dancers, we also have bird uh, singers and dancers from our Southern Paiute tribe, but also joined with the Fort Mojave. So the Fort Mojave tribe is just south of us um, in the, not Needles, well Needles, Laughlin, Laughlin area. And <clears throat> one of our tribal members is married to uh, the singer here that you see with the gourd. His name's Sam Evanston and he's a, a very well-known bird singer. And for the bird songs, those are songs that are sung in the language that describe the cultural landscape. So when the songs are being sung, they're describing what this bird's journey is. And then the, the, the women, they dance in front, and they have uh, footwork that mimics the, the steps of a bird. It's really beautiful. In fact, here's to, uh, two of our dancers. <laughs> and this is at the... Uh, our annual uh, Old Fort Indigenous Peoples Marketplace. And we've made this an annual event that we've partnered with at that uh, Nevada State Park. And that has been something that's been ongoing every Public Lands Day, so around September 24th, 25th. And hopefully y'all can come out to see that as well. And besides our, uh, our Native American communities, I mean, we're also connected to this indigenous pathway. So we have our Danza Azteca group, Kapoli uh, Talataloko, and this group emerged just a few years ago, and they've been performing with us at different activities and events, and have even joined us in the powwow circle a few years ago. And here's another photo of those dancers. Before I skip, oh, I don't know how to go back. Uh, wait, there we go. Okay, so I talked about these different dance groups, and these are the three different dance groups that I want to perform at the opening ceremony. Because I, like I said, our Paiute people were not the only ones who are a part of the historic West Side School, but it was also the Latinx community that attended this school. So it's gonna be really important to merge that connection and to respect that history And here is the budget. Um, I broke this down between the different meetings that would take place, the land acknowledgement plaque and consultation, administrative planning, paperwork, phone calls, all the other administrative things we do, um, the organizing and contracting the dance groups so that we don't have to make different checks to every people. We process the checks through our business to give to these different groups. Uh, ceremonial, ceremonial protocols training. There's more about the history that I can't cover in this short time here, but I want all of our, um, <clears throat> everybody who's working on this with the historic preservation to be aware about these histories, to learn a bit about it. Um, let me see, opening ceremony, the welcome and land acknowledgement, to be able to welcome all the people that are there, you know, to this momentous occasion, to be able to speak before everyone and to introduce the groups, to talk about these groups, the importance, and educate the public about the different dance styles that they're going to be seeing. Because it's one thing to see the dances, yes, they're very beautiful, absolutely stunning, colorful dances, but it's another thing to know about the purpose behind the steps, uh, why these dances are danced, and there's histories behind them too. Um, oh, oh. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, uh, parade participation. Um, like Diane was saying, there's going to be a parade that's planned for this, and when I talk to these different groups about it, they're very excited about the idea of attending a parade, and most haven't attended one in a very long time. 
Um, in fact, to put it into context, I haven't been a part of a parade for maybe 20 years. Um, but, but they're a lot of fun, and they're community building, too. And I think it's going to be really important to have that within this uh, historic West Side Centennial. Um, also, you know, the other thing, staging the dancers for photos, videos with our groups. And that's about it. And anything else that you want to learn about me, um, my CV, my bio, everything is listed on my website for newwooart.com. And, and I'm open for any questions. And I'm hoping that you have some questions about this and what we're proposing for the opening ceremony. Thank you. So this is uh, item 23-0124-HPC1. Uh, it's a uh, question of funding in the amount of $18,500 for consultation services for the centennial celebration at the West Side School. Any questions regarding that? Commissioner Purdue, I found that amount to be high for uh, lo local groups <coughs> that were, for the most part, um, non-professional. I thought that that budget seemed too high. Well, no further questions, we'd look for a motion. Well, do you want me to answer the question, or was it a statement? Because the, the dancers are actually professional dancers. Some of these dancers have been dancing for over 20 plus years of their lives. And some of them are also champion dancers in the powwow circle. Thank you. Further questions? If not, we'd look for a motion. I'll motion to approve uh, Commissioner Roberts for the record. All right, we have a motion to approve. Further discussion by the board? Further discussion, general public? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. I oppose. I'm sorry, was there one opposed? Two. Excuse me, on the phone, are both of you in favor? I just guess on the phone, opposed. Thank you. And Commissioner Moody, you're in favor? Paul right? Moody. Pardon me? Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, so there's two no's and the rest are in favor. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 23-0125, that's HPC1, discussion for possible action regarding the approval of funding up to $1,020 for the production of a cast bronze land acknowledgement plaque for the centennial celebration of the historic West Side School. Dr. Seabrand. Uh, Seabrand, for the record. So this is a, obviously adds on or piggybacks off of the item we just um, heard, and this is to actually produce the plaque. Now, we don't have the final price because it, working with, uh, with Vaughn on the language, it will depend on how much language there is and the, the size of the plaque. But the most expensive it will be is $1,020, and that's for the production of the plaque and the shipping of the plaque. Uh, we will use the same... Um, vendor that we use for our historic preservation um, plaques that we put on uh, the buildings that we put on a register. And so we just need the approval for the funding for this plaque to mount on this school. Question by the uh, commission. Uh, Commissioner Roberts, for the record, I <coughs> is the installation included in any of these prices? We, we always give it to the um, whoever the owner is of that property to install it. The city owns that property, so we'll have Public Works install it. So that, uh, so that price will be, it's not included here, it's essentially No, this is, the, this is the plaque and the shipping. Because these are produced in Pennsylvania, so it has to ship from Pennsylvania to Las Vegas. Thank you. So long for the record, just to be clear, this is not an HPC plaque. Well, it's sponsored by the HPC. 
and that will, we will reflect that on the, on the plaque. I, I, I'm a bit confused because the previous uh, 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 approval by this commission was included $500 for consultation for the plaque. Correct, that's for the consultation for the wording on the plaque, but the plaque itself costs this amount. The, the, the plaque price is just the plaque. You can put anything on that plaque. I'm, I'm with you on that. Okay. I'm, the question is, is, if this is an HPC plaque, will the HPC be involved in the wording? It will come through this commission for approval, yes. But the wording will be, as part of the first presentation, Fawn will work with, with our department and cultural affairs and the large working group on that language, then we'll bring it in front of the HPC. And we'll be able to change the wording at that point? Well, I can't predict the future, so, but we would think that the consultation we have from the indigenous community, as well as our directors and our other departments, would be the language that we bring before the commission that we would like to have approval if they do approve of it. I, I, I'm still not clear. Is, is the answer, will the HPC be involved in the wording? The HPC can approve the wording. If you don't like the wording, you cannot approve it and we can go back and work on another draft. I, it would seem to me that it would be best to have that all worked out in, in advance. I know one member of the, of the commission, Commissioner Laramie, uh, unfortunately has a, uh, uh, has a challenge, personal challenge this morning, but she emailed me that she would be in favor of the plaque, but only if the commission had some involvement in the, uh, uh, so I put that on the record. Uh, the commission has been involved in the wording of the other plaques. If well, it has its name on it, it should have some, some say in what's, what's written on there. Right, so the way we do the other plaques is we have the wording, it's very simplistic, it just says the year of the building and that it was the name of whatever that property is and that it was placed on the historic register by the Historic Preservation Commission on the date of the whatever meeting it was approved at. We bring that before this commission and that commission approves that plaque. There's no input on wording. but. As I said, that when we have the plaque language, we will bring it in front of the HPC and they can vote on it if they do not like the language and we can take your comments and come back with a second draft. Further questions? Uh, Commissioner Perdue, Please. is is this um, plaque only for acknowledgement of the land? Yes. Not the building? Correct. Right, because the subject is, is indicates it's it's for the it's for the school. Uh, it's to indicate and acknowledge the land on which the school is yeah. built. Okay. All right. What Any further discussion? What What is the timeline that that has to be ready for the ceremony in September? Correct. Right. So the ceremony September 30th. But it's once we have this language sorted, then there's the we have to send it to, for production proofs and then the shipping. It's usually six to eight weeks. All right. That's so. So we we, we need to do this in the we need to be approving this in like May June meeting at the latest. We could probably, yeah, June, July. It doesn't have to be May. I mean, okay. the ceremony is not until September 30th. All right, June, July, okay. All right, thank you. Look for a motion. I'd Commissioner Purdue, so move that we approve the $1,020 for the production of a cast brown plaque. Right. And Jack Levine, for the record, I'll second. We have a motion, we have a second for the discussion. General public. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Hotchkiss votes on the phone. Commissioner Hotchkiss, did you say nay? I said aye. Oh, okay, thank you. And Commissioner Moody, you're in support? Correct. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Move on then to the next agenda item, 23-0126-HPC1, final report by staff of the Neon Museum regarding the completion of the Boneyard Educational Panels. Dr. Sebring. 
Thank you, so Superintendent, for the record. So this commission awarded a $10,000 grant to the Neon Museum to create the information signs in their boneyard. Uh, this was a matching grant, um, as per our grants are, and the project has been completed. Um, I did see it, it's very nice, and now I believe we have Jen and Aaron here to give us a presentation, and I don't know if the internet's back up or not, so the links may not work if we'll you have to get to the website. We're good <laughs> at We're describing. flexible. Okay. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. It's great to see all of you. Um, and it's really exciting for Jennifer and myself to be able to stand before you and give you outcomes. So uh, the, the uh, HPC has been so generous to us in supporting the NEON Museum. It's great to be able to show you what your investment allows us to do. So um, this is the new educational signage that is at the base of the hard rock guitar that is the centerpiece of the neon museum so the goal and this was part of our original ask when we came to you we had learning objectives as we do with everything that we do at the neon museum one was to provide diverse visitors a sense of place we wanted them to understand better um, that if you are staying in Resorts World on the Strip, that that was the stardust. And so being able to have that sense of place, same is true for Fremont, and we'll show you how we presented that to, to the public. Provide a visual reference for Las Vegas' past and its present. Highlight advances in sign technology and architecture, and most importantly, define the term boneyard. This is um, coming from a guy who works for a junkyard, who works for a graveyard. We work for a boneyard, and a boneyard is a very specific term that is unique to the sign industry. We want to make sure that we're educating our public about what is a boneyard in particular. So. With that, um, this is what the before picture looks like. So the base of that Hard Rock Cafe guitar had uh, individual panels which showed the girder work supporting the guitar. Um, and those panels were uh, representing donors who were very generous. Um, however, that was from several years ago. This was an opportunity to continue showcasing those donors in a different way, but actually use that incredibly invaluable real estate to educate. So we created the timeline to do research, image selection. Um, we contracted with a local artist, Abby Wren. Um, we'll show you this in greater detail, don't worry. Um, contracted with Hartlauer Signs to actually work together and be the project manager to bring this all to, be, to being. Um, we created QR codes with interactive websites, which we'll maybe show you depending on internet usage. Um, and then of course created staff training so that it is now incorporated into the, the tour experience and also the general admission experience. So during the day, people free flow through the museum and do self-guided experience. And at night we have guided tours. So that training was part of this as well. We had to, of course, remove the donor panels that were in there and install the new educational paneling and then the lighting so that it's viewed at night. Uh, the panel on the left shows the, the mock-ups that we created um, in order to do this. Don't squint your eyes, don't worry, we'll <laughs> show you real things here in a second. Um, so we're gonna see. I think you hit advance, it should play. Let's see if it works. <laughs> There's that, that just shows you the basic installation process that we went through. I hope you can notice the difference between 
those donor panels and again that open girder system to actually putting in educational material and we'll go through some of that with this the um is this the video this is a video that we posted on social media um, and so you'll see a little bit of stats of what our engagement was like and now we'll show you the video yeah this is taken during sunset and you'll see some of our visitors in it but the engagement is what we really wanted to be able to focus, um, you uh, be able to show you is the number of people who are standing in front using these different panels and looking at the information that's provided to them. Many of them were camera shy, <laughs> running from me as I was trying to capture them. But in Facebook, we reached over uh, almost, well, 4,300 people, um, and then 81 comments. So an engagement is a comment that someone adds to, um, to social media. On Instagram, over 7,000 people and 270 uh, engagements and comments that were put in. LinkedIn alone, um, which is not necessarily the go-to source for educational information, it's a business channel. LinkedIn had 222 impressions and 14 engagements. So it really is resonating on the social media level, and that was just one day. Um, so these are QR codes. We created QR codes on each panel um, for two reasons. One is we wanted people to have the opportunity to dig deeper and go beyond what they saw on the map itself. And two, it became a metric for, six, uh, for our own success and being able to determine how involved people are. Are they actually you know, viewing the map or are they uh, simply just passing by it? So it became a way of looking at how interactive this piece became. We found that in um, uh, that this period of time, we had about 1,400 QR scans. So people who are coming up, applying their, their phone and scanning that QR code and we had about 2,000 uses of a slider, which I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do. So it that, I didn't. now I'm going the wrong way. What am I doing? I'm going. Look, I'm just oh. getting drunk. Can you help me? <laughs> you just need to hit the back button. I did. I swear. Um, oh. It's not Jeff. Jeff's paying, always paying okay. attention. There we go. Okay, you start from the beginning. <laughs> okay, forgive me, Jeff, wherever you are, God above me. Um, <laughs> Okay. So these QR codes, one of the new things that we added to this that we found was really effective was a slider tool from a company called Interacity. So we can layer images on top of each other. So on the Fremont Street featured properties, you can see the plaza. The black and white image is of the, real, uh, the train station. So if you, you can move that bar and kind of see what it looked like before and what it looks like now. So we did it with all of the properties that we featured. And again, that QR code is prominently displayed down below. All of the properties are listed on that QR code. So if your interest is the plaza, that's great. Um, but you have the opportunity to explore all of the sites that are tied to that Fremont Street, uh, the different properties that we highlight on Fremont Street. So um, the same as uh, the, the QR, the sliding, feature is one that we're seeing is really becoming very interactive both with adults mm -hmm. and especially with kids they and love that opportunity underneath the images there is educational material that talks about what was there before and what's there now again going back to that sense of place we want people to understand that the las vegas club stood where circa is today mm -hmm. and so being able to have that understanding that there's hallowed ground if you're staying at any of these properties there is a history that's there so the self-guided tour i love this photo um this is one of our great docents randy um and <laughs> This was a slightly embarrassing question that someone asked me about a property in Las Vegas that I couldn't answer. And um, so I ran over to Randy and I was like, hey Randy, quick, come over and show this. And within five or 10 seconds, he had a group of about 15 to 20 people who 
who gathered around and began exploring the, the signage itself. So it became a much more enhanced product. And from that, that's where more training became necessary for our staff so that our docents are now incorporating the map into what we're showcasing and being able to add that into our tour. We want people to end with this experience so that they can have some of that self-guided experience, but also our docents are there to further answer questions. We're getting a higher guest satisfaction. Visitors are staying longer on the property, um, which is fun. Um, we are also seeing more family interaction. So we have families who are coming in and showing off properties, especially on Fremont Street, talking about their memories to their kids of these properties. So it's terrific. We've had over 22,000 visitors from the day that we opened, which was November 1st with the new signage and uh, to the end of February. Yes. And that's just during our self-guided tours. So again, Aaron referenced during guided tours at the end, they'll stop at this area and then we give folks time to take a peek. We've also added, um, this year we've launched school field trips um, and we've had 358 students between November and February that have come through um, providing this built-in learning component that can be engaged in very different levels. As we mentioned, the kids really love that interactive QR opportunity, the, op the, the ability to use that slider and see that before and after picture. Um, it's also great for the teachers who are able to then use that QR code and that website address to then further the learning experience outside their trip to the Neon Museum. It also is becoming probably our number one photo mm -hmm. op spot at the museum. So people love having, of course, the guitar behind them and the Neon Museum's logo there, but then also that learning information um, on the side. STEAM Saturdays is another program that is highly using this, uh, this new interaction. Um, there are about 600 participants in STEAM Saturdays between November 1st and the end of February. The information from the panels is used on scavenger hunts throughout the um, uh, property. So STEAM Saturday, we have a very strong belief, which is that you cannot create a sign without science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. So if that's the case, then let's actually emphasize that and really drive that educational component home. And then parents and kids are just having a great time with the online content that's provided. Um, here's our budget. Um, so we, we had a grant total of $10,000. The museum absorbed about 2,600 uh, out of that into making this happen. Uh, and we're done. <laughs> no, cool. okay. And, and we're back. Um, and so uh, that is that. Are there questions I can answer, Jen can answer? to tell you about this this incredible investment. Question, comment, please. Commissioner Gillespie, for the record, this is not a question, but this is fantastic. And I'm really happy to see how you've made these elements interactive. And f coming from a museum where we have a lot of images of the before and not so much of the before and now, that's what people are, get really, you know, get really engaged in so I'm really I really like that connection that you made thank so you. kudos thank that you. means a lot coming from you Hollis thank you very much and you know what we've found is the neon boneyard is our exhibit space it's all outdoors so we can't put a TV monitor out there to show that slider but we can encourage further discovery on their phones quick question sort of the excuse me so off for the record we've got a lot of rain over the last uh, we always during the spring, but sure. how do you handle the, the outdoor things in the, in the boneyard? Uh, would you, how are they protected or, or taken care of? The signage in particular? Yes. The, the, so the signage. Well, and the staff too. <laughs> and the staff. Um, so depending on the amount of rain, um, we, we operate rain or shine. Um, bigger, bigger risk for us, obviously monsoon, things like that, that's, we would shut down for that or delay uh, tour or uh, entry for those types of an air, uh, experiences. Bigger issue for us is actually wind. 
So wind, when you have an 82 foot tall guitar that again is made of glass, um, wind becomes a, a danger. So we want to make sure that we're providing a safe environment to our in, to our guests and of course our staff. So um, so we provide umbrellas that are available for rainy way, rainy days like we've had for the what feels like the last six weeks straight. Um, but we also have uh, those same umbrellas are used in the summer to keep people out of the sun directly. And specifically for the education panels, that's why we work with sign companies who specialize in outdoor signage. So there's UV coating on it. They're using the right materials that'll hold up against rain, wind, sun, all of that. And also to piggyback on what Jen has just said, those panels that you saw, so we have, we have a, a Fremont Street, a strip, we have the Neon Museum logo, we have um, scale. A, a scale, size and scale. So right now when someone comes in and says, how big was the Stardust sign? We tell them, look at the guitar, imagine that twice as tall plus 10 feet. Okay, that's great, but that doesn't really convey that understanding. So, so this size comparison chart really helps people mm -hmm. understand how strong the Le Conscious sign was or how big the Stardust sign was as compared to what they can see in situ with that guitar. Um, so with that, I think that there's a great opportunity in working with the sign manufacturers. We worked very thoughtfully so that any of those individual panels should the landscape of Las Vegas change, which we know never happens, um, that we can trade out those panels at a very affordable price and put up a new updated panel very easily. Excuse me. Sorry. The, my question was really the, the, uh, historic preservation with material that is outside, yeah. uh, uh, and, and that presents a challenge with both the wind and the rain. But, but thank you very much. Any other further questions? Yeah, Commissioner Surface, I just want to compliment you, like my fellow commissioner. Uh, great job, and really important how you've uh, done placemaking in this part of the city as well, and developed a sense of community. And also, uh, in my pet world, uh, it's really cool to see how you're educating folks about the architecture of these signs as well. So kudos to you, as, as my fellow commissioner said, but from a different angle. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. We, we think this is a great investment, and we're so thankful to the HPC for your generosity and your support behind the Neon Museum. So we thank you. We suspect we're going to see you again. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Oh. Let's move on to the next agenda item, which is number 1023-0127-HPC1. Report by the Community Development Department regarding nominations for the City of Las Vegas 11 Most Endangered Historic Places list. Dr. Seabrand? Okay, sorry for the delay. Seabrand, for the record. So we did have a late entry on this, so um, I did provide a copy of that list to the, to the clerk. So for our 11 most endangered list, so these are the current, the current list includes, of course, the Huntridge Theater, the Fremont Street Motor Courts, Old Las Vegas High School, Wedding Chapels on Las Vegas Boulevard, Jackson Avenue, uh, McWilliams, Townside, El Portel, Reed Whipple, Bridger, Moulin Rouge, and the Google Commercial Building, as we all know, the Reed Whipple was demolished in um, October of this year, I'm sorry, last year. So we have new nominations. The new nominations are on the screen in front of you. They include, and these were from a couple different commissioners and several commissioners had the same um, item or the same property on, on their list, so we combined the lists. And as I said, we had a last uh, minute entry that I'll read here in a minute, but the new nominations are Vegas Fix Sign, the Huntridge Circle Park, the Mormon Fort, the Binion Home, Morelli House, Huntridge Theater, that's already on the list, uh, Frontier Fidelity Savings Bank, uh, Pete Findlay Oldsmobile, 
El Portel, Siegfried and Roy House, Cantrell's Cleaners, uh, Googie Style Gas Station at 2300 Western Avenue, historic neighborhoods and residential properties in the city of Las Vegas. We would need more specifics on that. And then the latest entries were LDS Chapel at 501 South 9th, the Super Cleaners at 800 South Las Vegas Boulevard, Donna Maria's at 910 South Las Vegas Boulevard, as well as uh, some of the houses in our um, Las Vegas, uh, I'm sorry, the Las Vegas High School Neighborhood District, and we would need addresses for those as well. And we'll, Teresa will send everybody this, this list. So these are the nominations, and we've called this the 11 most endangered. Now, it doesn't have to be 11, it can be as many as we want, since this, of course, is not something we can act on as far as if it's a private property and we say it's in danger, we can't go there and, um, you know, have them put it on our register unless they agree to have it on our register. We could help them with that process, of course. And it, when we help them with that process, they are eligible for grants, so we hope to add more properties on our historic register. Uh, this is just a also a list that we can look at what we prioritize of what next projects are. And so today, just as a discussion about some of these, and then we will vote on these at our, at our next meeting. And again, we'll send you all of these so that you can do some homework on them and research on them, see if you want to uh, <coughs> keep them on the list, if we want to expand our list from 11 to 15, 20. It's, we'll have to vote on that as well. So I'm happy to take discussion and questions. So uh, just, just some clarification, one, the 11, the number 11 comes from the National Trust for Historic Places. Several decades ago, they did uh, surveys of historic preservation groups and universities and, and to come up with a list of the top 10 uh, uh, historic places in the United States. Uh, they narrowed it down to 11 and they couldn't decide between 10 and 11 so they decided to come up with the 11 most endangered list because they couldn't make a decision. For the last three or four decades, states and, and communities around the country have adopted that as, as uh, a way to stand out from top 10 lists and, and it's an 11. I, I don't see any reason to move from that. I mean, again, as the Dr. Seabrand said, we're not encumbered by that, but it would just sort of fit the pattern that has been uh, uh, in place for, for several decades. Secondly, uh, as Dr. Seabrandt said, this is not a legal document. Uh, uh, this is not going on the National Register, has no impact beyond uh, education. Um, uh, Reno uses their term as the, the uh, places that uh, you should l look out for, or there's a specific term. We decided on endangered, so any of that can be changed at the, at the, at the next meeting. Um, if there's something that you uh, uh, would like to change beyond sending your votes into Dr. Seabrandt, um, uh, please let her know that as well. Beyond that, are there any questions, comments? Uh, and I assume that uh, we have closed the nominations at this point? Yes, we are right, closed. Thank you. All right, then let's move on then to the next item, which is 1128-0128-HPC1, a report by the Community uh, Development Department, the director. Uh, Stephen, for the record, so Director Floyd did have to depart, but he did not have any updates for this meeting. Okay. Move on to number 12 then, 23-029-HPC1, report by the Community Department regarding its uh, development, uh, an updated list is that as well. Dr. Seabrand? Uh, Seabrand for the record. So for our updates, there's really not um, anything different than our everything's in progress. Um, the West Side Survey and the Charleston Heights Survey, those reports will be at our um, April 12th meeting. So make sure you're at our April meeting. The Rafael Rivera Survey is in progress. The Twin Lakes Survey, the RFP bidding is still in progress. The uh, proposals are due on March 27th. 
And then we have our design review guidelines. They will also be at our April 12th meeting. So a lot of um, reports at our April 12th meeting. The endangered list updates we just spoke about, it's uh, still in progress. So remember we have the El Dorado Days Parade on May 13th. I only have two HPC members that have agreed to participate. So still hoping that some others will be able to join us during the parade from 10 to noon. Remember that's also the day of the film premiere, the city of Las Vegas, the 50s. That is the 13th starting at 6 p.m. and invitations will be sent at the beginning of April. Um, so you will be receiving those from Teresa in the next couple weeks. And the premiere will be held at the Beverly Theater. It's brand new, just opened uh, this month uh, and it's at 515 South 6th Street. So make sure you mark your calendars for that. And just as a reminder, as I said, the next HPC meeting is earlier than regularly scheduled. It is on the 12th of April, it, it's still at noon. And that's all I have. Oh, actually, I did have updates. There were questions at the last meeting, although one was from Commissioner Moody, who I think just disconnected the phone. It was about putting the names of all commissioners on the, um, the agenda that is released by the city clerk's office. And unfortunately, that's not um, possible. The only um, names that are on the agendas are for the Planning Commission and the elected members of City Council. Um, it's due to there are 30 boards, uh, more than 100 board members, and so it's um, board members are changing all the time. So we'll our agenda just says HPC, and just know that proud that you're part of the HPC. There is also a question about um, having this uh, meeting on the television on. Um, our channel two, like planning commission and um, city council is. But again, it's there's so many boards and none of the boards, including our board, are on TV. Uh, it's only planning commission and city council. So now I can answer any questions. Your mic, please. Sorry, apologize. Item 13 is 23-0130-HPC1 report uh, regarding uh, items that are in the media. That's in your uh, uh, packet. Any further questions? Move on to agenda item 14, 23-0131-HPC1 discussion regarding topics for future agenda items by the Historic Preservation Commission. Comments made by at this portion, during this portion of the agenda by individual commission members shall refer solely to proposals for future agenda items and any discussion should be limited as to whether or not such items uh, are within the purview of the commission and or whether such proposed items shall be placed on a future agenda. No discussion regarding the substance of any proposal proposed a topic shall occur and no action shall be taken regarding the proposal. Does anybody have anything you would like to see on a future agenda? Uh, Commissioner Please. Roberts, for the record. Um, so it actually coincides with one of the 11 most endangered submissions that I put in, which was for the uh, historic neighborhoods. Something that I've experienced uh, personally, and we, I think we've all been seeing for a while, folks who live um, in some of the historic neighborhoods. Um, during the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of uh, real estate action and there's been a lot of house flipping going on. Um, so in that process, um, usually the uh, actions by s certain bad actors uh, are in flagrant violation of both uh, uh, building and safety code, but the, uh, which is, should be an, an issue that the city takes on. Uh, separately, but uh, within the purview of the HPC, um, we're seeing a lot of um, original, uh, distinctive, uh, distinguishing architectural features for um, ver the very few um, original properties that we have still left. Uh, we're seeing a lot of those uh, distinguishing architectural features just completely destroyed, um, and, and not only not only are they being destroyed, but they're being destroyed illegally in the sense that this is most often unpermitted work uh, by unlicensed contractors. 
Um, sometimes it's licensed contractors that choose not to pull a permit. Um, regardless, it's a, it has a very uh, negative and adverse effect to um, the historic uh, neighborhoods. And I think uh, for anybody, for any of the uh, folks here who were at the last uh, design guidelines meeting for Beverly Green, um, it was, you know, heated and, and, and people are confused and they're, so I think, I think that we could probably help um, by uh, maybe offering a carrot before a stick, but uh, to um, uh, developers or uh, uh, real estate investors who want to take a house and just squeeze as much money out of it as they can and leave it in the, in the wake for whoever is gonna be the next resident or owner of that house. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know too many people who haven't uh, purchased a home that was, um, you know, it's much larger than it actually appraises for because there's a bunch of additions that were made illegally and, and uh, carports are, are filled in and, and whatnot. And a lot of this is, uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons that- uh, I for, for interrupting, is there Please. a specific, I mean, what's the item? Because there's a public comment period coming up. If sure. There, or is there a specific item you what? want to put? Yes, I think that I think that we should uh, we should identify uh, historic neighborhoods as a <coughs> threatened uh, area. Okay. And 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 we should identify the a timeline that is somewhat uh, predictive of the future, like maybe anything after or before 1980. By the time we get around to it, it's going to be, you know, the the 70s is is going to essentially represent 50 years. So uh, I think we should think ahead, be, be a little bit proactive on this as opposed to only reactive, which seems to be part of the, the problem uh, or contributing to, to part of the problem here. Well, I can answer that, Superintendent, for the record. Sure. So we are proactive. Uh, we are proactive with our surveys. So our surveys are surveying these properties. Our um, Twin Lakes is going to be surveying properties all the way up to the 1980s. So I'm not clear though what you want that agenda to be. I mean, we are proactive. We have our neighborhood meetings. You were there. You see that they're always not um, very positive towards city staff. Um, there's if there's unpermitted work occurring on a historic house, unless somebody tells me about that, I don't know about it. So if you see that, please contact me. Send me an email. Send me a text. I'll get. Um, ask code enforcement to go over there, code enforcement will respond, and they will advise them they have to do a certificate of appropriateness, and then we'll all contact them and then guide that homeowner through their certificate of appropriateness um, process. They'll come before this board. Oh, well, we're, again, I apologize we're, to both of you. We're getting kind of into a Right, but I want to know what the item is, though. I heard that question, and, 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 and then I heard the continuous dialogue of, uh, right, that we're doing some stuff. Right, because I'm answering his questions, stuff. Chairman. So is there, sp uh, what I would propose is, if you have a specific item that you would like to see on the agenda, if you could draft that and send it to Dr. Seabrandt, that would just be helpful, and then we can close this out, then we can go to public comment and we can continue the dialogue. Uh, that's fair. Thank you. Any Further uh, uh, on, on things we'd like to see on the next agenda? Yes, I'd like to see on the next agenda uh, or a future agenda as soon as possible um, in, in honor of the West Side School or the uh, branch number one of the Las Vegas Grammar School had a chance to review uh, the National Historic Registration nomination and the West Side School uh, is on the National Register. However, the 1979 nomination is way out of date, contains uh, uh, information that needs to be updated, important information. Uh, and I think in honor of the school, we should fund uh, an updated uh, a document so that the facts that we rely upon are in fact facts and, and not just wishful thinking. So if we could, have some sort of a proposal to, to update. Uh, we've done updates before, and so I would just propose that we put that on the agenda. Okay. Any other things that we'd like to see on the agenda? If not, we'll move now to public comment where we can continue the discussion. Dr. Seabrand, I interrupted you. Please go ahead. I have nothing further, thank you. Commissioner? Well, I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, 
confuse anyone, I just wanted to clarify if I can uh, any further. Um, there was, uh, um, there's been several incidents that have occurred uh, that I've, you know, been attempted to be proactive on in my neighborhood along with several other of my neighbors. Um, it's a very, very slow process with code enforcement. It's a, it's a very, this is not, so, so um, Dr. Sebrand, to, to your point, I, I, I hear you loud and clear. I experience it firsthand. I guess what I'm saying is, uh, or proposing or requesting is, um, if there's a way to put another layer of um, a protective layer, even if it's a thin veil, over a, a, a neighborhood so that there is another check that has to occur before someone can come in, buy 200 houses, tear off half of the house, slap up a bunch of, you know, work on there without, because uh, the, the HPC is what we are, what we are, and, and, and you know, people either want to abide by, by uh, um, guidelines or not. But uh, what's, what's happening right now is, not, is essentially not working. We're losing a lot of uh, historic uh, properties uh, and, their, and their distinguishing architectural features because of this. I, I, it's not anyone's fault, per se, at least that not anyone here, but I'm just trying to uh, start the conversation to see what we can do to help uh, mitigate that, that ongoing risk. Great. Thank you, and I think part of the uh, the process is the public hearings that, uh, that we're hearing. Um, I appreciate all the board members that were able to attend this last one. It was uh, informative, as, as they all are. That's part of the process and uh, brings to light the opportunities and challenges with uh, the, the neighborhoods that are currently recognized. And, and I'm excited to, uh, to see the, the, the two reports, or three reports that are coming up on uh, Charleston Heights neighborhood, the east side, the west side, and I believe there's one more. This will provide a, a, a lot of factual detail and it will also allow us to uh, 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 bring to light the, the, the opportunities and the challenges that you spoke of. Uh, I, I drive through the, the, the John S. Park neighborhood three or four times a month or five times or more than that. And sometimes I, it's hard to drive through those neighborhoods because th th there's no, they're no longer a, a road there that's drivable because there's cars parked on, on both sides and work is being done. Um, so it is, it is a challenge, but I appreciate your, your comments and, and moving forward. Other comments, please. <coughs> Thanks, Dan. I, I, I agree so much. Um, and I, I, I agree, I'd like to see it on the uh, agenda for further discussion. I'm not, you know, speaking to come up with a solution, but one thing that I've noticed on top of the other things that Dan mentioned is just um, misinformation or no information. Uh, for example, my, my uh, neighbor, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, who's very involved with the uh, Paradise Palms group, uh, was telling everybody at the party, I'm gonna, <coughs> I'm gonna tear all the wood siding off my house and I'm gonna get stucco. And everybody's like, what? You can't do that. And she's like, yeah, I can. I can do whatever I want. And it, four or five people told her she's lucky she rolls in that, that environment where, um, you know, a lot of the people understand. But I think there's a lot, lot of uh, non-understanding. I'm wondering if we can just, and again, we could talk about this in more depth in, in the f some future date, but you know the little card that comes out when Planning Commission um, has an agenda item if you're in the neighborhood? If we could send a little official City of Las Vegas card with some simple instructions, like don't tear the front of your house off kind of thing. And if you need more information, call this number or something like that, you know, just so that um, the ones that, and I would feel awful if she was here in front of us after she spent $50,000 on a new stucco in the front of her house because she legitimately acted like she didn't know. That's all I have to say, but thanks, Dan, I agree. And if I could just interject here, we do that, uh, Commissioner Palacios. We have sent out door hangers to every house in our listed neighborhoods. Uh, we can send out more da door hangers, we send out postcards, we have our meetings, so we are proactive and we are informing the neighbors. Unfortunately, not everybody comes to our meetings or they may not read our door hangers, but uh, we, are, we are doing that. So we can, of course, revisit doing it again. Thank you. <coughs>